The oldest political party in New Zealand, Labour's roots were forged on the West Coast. Times were hard and many Kiwis worked and lived in appalling conditions. Labour fought for a fair New Zealand. Food, clothing, shelter and a living wage for all. Wellington watched helplessly as unemployment gripped the nation. This is no burlesque of life. This was life in New Zealand. Into the political vacuum swept Michael Joseph Savage and New Zealand had its first Labour government. Our mission is to build and not to destroy the social structure. Pulling the country out of depression, Labour's vision for the future became the New Zealand way of life. Under a Labour government which puts people before things, the health services claim a high priority. Labour addressed the housing shortage by building thousands of homes. For the family man, nothing gives so much satisfaction as a house to himself and a garden to break in. From free milk for school children to the world's first social security legislation, Labour's New Zealand boasted high living standards and one of the smallest gaps between rich and poor on the planet. For young people of ability, the Labour government has ensured free entrance to the university. After Savage's death, Peter Fraser took the helm. New Zealand is appreciated very highly because of its leadership in social progress. He pushed for New Zealand command over Kiwi troops and tried to ensure they weren't treated as cannon fodder. Labour was still in power when our boys came home and made sure there were opportunities to greet them. The country showed its gratitude by putting them back into power. In just 14 years, Labour had built a prosperous, thriving nation. But by 1951, National was in power and at war on the wharves. 22,000 men were off the job. National made it illegal to help the wives and children of the workers. Under Walter Nash, the second Labour government focused on local production. But a tax on cigarettes and alcohol was well ahead of its time, and the 60s went to National. Labour came back with Norman Kirk, a man of the people. Big Norm tackled the housing shortage, gave pensioners a Christmas bonus, and created a superannuation scheme that would be a $240 billion asset today if National hadn't dismantled it. I don't think we want to see in New Zealand industries taken over by a pension board. The Muldoon years polarised the country. Labour won the popular vote in 78 and 81, but National moved the electoral boundary goalposts and maintained power. In 1981, goalposts split the country in two. After nine years of National, the economy was on the verge of collapse. David Longy and Labour came to power, introducing groundbreaking social reforms. Finance Minister Roger Douglas restructured the economy. But his free market policies and asset sales didn't belong with Labour. The party was divided and ultimately, Douglas left to form ACT. Longy resigned, but would be remembered for declaring New Zealand nuclear free. During the 90s, National continued to sell off state assets. This is going to be the mother of all budgets, yes, as they say, duh. Unemployment skyrocketed, while benefits were slashed. It was the era of market rents for state homes. Evictions, hospital charges, and the erosion of workers' rights. Labour was swept back into power. The party had returned to its core values. They lowered state house rents and raised the minimum wage. There was a budget surplus, and New Zealand had the lowest unemployment in the OECD. Labour was back, and people mattered more than ideology. I know what it's like to be poor. My father, he was dead at 47. So my mother was on a widow's pension with three boys. Phil used to go there when he was growing up and talk to her about it. He never got the politics from me. 
Well, she was always a very staunch Labour person and she was staunchly Labour because when they moved to New Zealand from England uh, after the First War, my grandfather had been a prisoner of war, he'd been gassed on the Somme and he died nine years after they came to New Zealand. That left my grandmother with three young boys. That almost paid off their house, but without an income, they had a mortgagee sale on the house and they lost everything. When Savage got elected as Labour's first Prime Minister, one of the first things that he did was lift the widow's benefit by a shilling a week. I used to listen to the stories that she talked about, the hard times. That was what made me labour. Eight miles of mountain ropeway from the mine face still leaves the coal in Deniston. There's a letter floating around in the family written by my grandmother who had come from Westport up to Deniston because it was the only place she could find a teaching job and she took notes and was the minute secretary at one of the Labour movement meetings. She was very proud of that and I guess that, you know, transferred through to her children without any direct teaching or preaching. The coal plummets down this incline, begins its long haul to the furnaces of industry. A connection to Deniston is something that many of us hold with pride because it was the wisdom, the activism of people up here that drove social justice issues and ultimately led to the Labour Party. My dad was a hunter, he was a fisherman, he was a hiker and he was an Anglican minister with a love for the Labour Party and social justice and I got bits of all of that from him. In a vicarage you see all sorts of families, all sorts of lives come through the front door, people in need and I guess I learned early about trying to help others and I think uh, those values have stuck with me. This is my old street, this is um, the street we lived in. Uh, Kofi Ave, and we moved here when I was pretty young. Murupara was a town that was entirely dependent on forestry, and in that period went from being a state-owned enterprise to being privatised completely, and the job losses at that time were enormous. Even though I was really young, I remember seeing what that did to the town, the social cost of unemployment. There is no doubt that this place has shaped the way I feel about what government role is in people's lives. And so, you know, ultimately that's why I am Labour. When I was um, at school and at university, I worked in the supermarket, uh, chopping up fruit and veggies. But when I worked there, that was when National brought in the Employment Contracts Act. And I saw the impact that that had on the people who worked there. Uh, they lost hours, they lost their double time, their time and a half. They saw the value of their wages sink. And I saw people literally lose money, lose their families as the pressure went on. So I turned to the Labour Party and I'm really proud of what we achieved. I've always been politically um, interested because we grew up in a household where politics was um, important. Our dad was a union activist and I think just generally I grew up with quite a strong social conscience and I went on to become a teacher. It was all about social justice and fairness and equity for me through my work and education. And I just became increasingly aware politically and then got involved. For me, it wasn't even a choice to get involved with Labour. I can't even comprehend going with any other political party, let alone national. <laughs> um, it was just part of who I was. Sir Walter Nash was my great grandfather, an iconic member of the first Labour government. He was part of that first movement who believed in a better way, who believed that you had a responsibility to look after everyone. And I think that's fundamental to what we believe in this day and age. Well, I certainly believe that. The Labour Party believes that. A caring society, basically. There is a huge difference between Labour and National, and it's what we are here for. To vote Labour is to ensure the future of our youngsters, just now setting out on life's adventure. It's always more complex for Labour because we're here for every New Zealander and all our aspirations and all our hopes. The National Party is just here to generate money on the basis that they think the trickle-down theory will deliver to each and every New Zealander. Well, we know it doesn't. You know, it's the rich pissing on the poor. That's their trickle-down theory. The National and its allies on the right come to politics uh, with a belief that free markets almost always produce the best outcome and wittingly or unwittingly, they are there to promote the interests of the strong and the rich. You know, I hear people all the time tell me that there's no difference between Labour and National, and for me, that couldn't be further from the truth. 
One of the founding principles of labour is fairness. We are all better off when we lift those who are struggling at the bottom up. If there is an opportunity for government to make a difference, and there is, we'll do it. We'll do everything that it takes. Family allowances have been liberalised. Average allowable income raised from £4 to £5 weekly. The Labour Party believed that if people were working and they were being productive, then they were contributing to society. And I just laugh when I see John Key's billboard saying, building a brighter future. But how does 58,000 young people unemployed, how's that a brighter future? How is selling state assets a brighter future? It simply isn't. What Labour has done is learnt from history and it's learnt from mistakes. That's why in the last Labour government, we didn't sell off assets. We had to buy back Air New Zealand because it had been bankrupted. We bought back Kiwi Rail because it had been asset stripped and run into the ground. The railway train came early to New Zealand, nationalised almost from the beginning. And we set up Kiwi Bank. The problem with National is that they haven't learnt from history. They ignore that history and they keep on making those mistakes. People have to understand the practical repercussions of selling off our assets. We're going to lose something between $700 and $900 million in dividends a year that could be going towards our health system, which could be going towards our education system, but without that money there, then what are we going to do? Asset sales are a road to nowhere. Uh, financially, they make no sense. Within nine years of selling, uh, we'll be worse off because we'll lose the dividends. People can't afford to buy them. Most of my constituents can't afford to buy them. So what we mean is we're selling them to someone else and the government's got no way of preventing them being on sold to foreigners. Who knows what would happen to our power prices uh, if we sold off our major power companies to foreign owners who have no interest in keeping power prices low uh, for Kiwi families. So the nation lives by electric power and the demands grow with our growing prosperity. These are assets that have built up over generations by sweat, toil, tears and taxes, and they want to sell them in a minute. Look, we've been down this route. It simply does not work. You sell them once and that's that. Once they're there on the open market, anyone can come in and buy them. And John Key's promised to give these to mum and dad investors. You know, how stupid does he think we are? Well, they talked about the mum and dad investors when Bill English sold off Contact Energy, but who did it go to? Majority owned in Australia and the majority ownership, the big corporates. ACC, arguably the most important, unique part of New Zealand society that everyone around the world is envious of. And these idiots want to start privatising it. You talk to people from the US, from the UK, from Australia, it either costs a whole lot more to have insurance or you don't get full cover, and in fact, we will be a lot poorer for that. I worked in the United States for a while, and I'll never forget the morning I walked out of my apartment building and I saw a woman collapse on the crossing in front of me. We ran over and helped her and someone called an ambulance. And when the ambulance arrived, the very first thing the ambulance driver did was reach into the purse of this woman to check her insurance card. I was shocked. ACC is a great system in New Zealand. It takes the profit that the lawyers and other systems around the world make out of it, and that money goes back to the people who have suffered from injuries, or it goes back into prevention. Nationals indicated quite clearly that ACC is on the list of things to be privatised. Since 1936, the Labour government has provided housing for 79,000 families. They deregulated the building industry and said, we'll leave it to them to work out how we can have safe houses. And then they deregulated the electricity industry and said, oh, we'll leave it to them to ensure fair and ongoing supply. They have all been absolute disasters. What's happened lately has been that the richest 10% have got much richer. The poorest 40% have got much poorer and the bunch in the middle have just been squeezed. They've given tax cuts to those who needed it the least and put up GST, which affects those on lowest incomes. It's just not fair. I, I think National's whole approach to taxation has been about rewarding those who already have the most and punishing those who have the least. National just doesn't get it. And let me give you one example. They came in in 2008 and they gave the top guys a tax cut. And then November last year, they gave the top guys a massive tax cut. So if you're earning a million dollars a year, and there's about 700 people, you've got a thousand dollars a week extra in the hand. And yet if you're living in Napier, 
um, on the median wage, you got $11 a week in the hand. Now, this was all financed by an increase in GST from 125 to 15%. So everyone paid it. The top guys did incredibly well, whereas the vast majority are going backwards. When we come across elderly who are saying to us that they no longer shower every day, to conserve water or they've turned the hot water off to conserve electricity. When you hear from mothers that they're watering down the milk so that it goes further, those types of things make me think what kind of developed country are we living in? I don't think the National Party cares about the significant difference between those struggling at the bottom and those at the top. Why else would we see that gap growing astronomically under John Key? When I was in LA, I saw panhandlers, you know, people sitting there holding out tin mugs at traffic lights and in street corners, begging. And I said to the American guy that was showing me around, I said, oh, crikey, we don't see that in New Zealand. And the other day, I was walking up and around Queen Street, looking around the streets, and there I saw these same guys, tin mugs out, begging for, for coins. And I just went, oh my gosh, we're going backwards, we're not going forward. We just have to open the pages of the papers or look around the world and say, that's not where we want to be and many of those countries have very poor people and very rich people, and New Zealand's heading in that direction. I don't want to live in a society where you have Mercedes-Benz behind a barbed wire fence and people on the other side can't afford wheat bix and milk. There is a different route we can go down, because there's no doubt about it, debt is too high at the moment. The government is borrowing too much. And that is partly to do with the economic situation, and it's partly to do with the fiscal policies this government's putting in place. We can reform the tax system. We can make it fairer for everyone. Everybody pays their fair share, everybody gets their fair share under Labor. Only half of the wealthiest New Zealanders pay the top tax rate. Why? Because wages are taxed and capital is not. And that's one way that the wealthy can legally avoid tax. In most other countries, those forms of income actually contribute to their respective economies through a capital gains tax, or CGT. You know, most of us pay tax on every dollar we earn, but somebody can go out there, speculate on property, and pay no tax at all. That's not right. If somebody's not paying their fair share, it means somebody else is paying that for them. New Zealand is a country designed by nature for challenge and for opportunity setting no end to possible achievement. Never before have we seen youth unemployment at the level that it is now. Almost 30% of our young people are looking for work. We are not willing to stand on the sideline while 58,000 young people do absolutely nothing. We're not willing to see that loss of potential. So what we've decided we'll do in Labor is transfer the money that a young person would be paid on the dole to an employer who's willing to support them and back them in an apprenticeship. Apprenticeships have increased under Labour rule from 3,929 in 1935 to over 8,000 in 1938. The door of advancement has been opened to youth. Recently we put out a cost of living video and it really was to highlight the policies that Labour would like to introduce. First $5,000 you make in personal income a year, whether you're a worker, a beneficiary or retired on super, will be tax free. Secondly, We'll take GST of all fresh fruit and vegetables. If you've got a growing gap between the rich and the poor, which is what is happening in New Zealand, then you ultimately will end up with conflict, with frustration, and ultimately with violence, which is not the society that we want. This election, I feel like we are at this enormous crossroads. We have a choice as to whether or not, for instance, we choose to keep our assets, you know, whether or not we choose to protect the next generation's future, or whether we sell it off. If we carry on the path that we're on, where we're leaving half the population behind and we're not investing in skills and technology, we won't be able to milk enough cows or dig up enough coal to make this country rich, and we'll continue the slide. We'll continue to get more divided. We'll lose a sense of who we are, and we'll either end up poor or a state of Australia, and I don't want either. Labor believes in governing this country for everybody, not just the wealthy and the powerful, not just the tax cuts for those who are already best off, but for everybody. And Labor has a, a, an absolutely fundamental belief in fairness that if we want to create a good society, 
If we want one New Zealand, not a divided country, then we've got to give every one of our children the best start in life. We've got to be fair to the whole community to get the best out of the community and to keep that community together. To guarantee economic security and keep freedom real, pay a tribute to achievement. Vote Labour again.